all I can say is wow. As you watch the news, as you see what is happening around our universities, as you see what's happening in some of our courtrooms, as you see what's happening in some of our capitals, I don't have anything to say except wow. I'm just blown away. Once again, welcome to God and Country, Episode 5. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for uh, joining us here on our show, Mr. Reed, sir. It's good to have you on. How are you doing? Well, uh, the midnight ride's keeping me pretty busy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was talking with you before we got to roll in here. I got myself pretty worked up about some of what's going on in the country. So I've got, to, I, can, I think I can keep going. I'll say this, you know, I have really enjoyed, I obviously I've enjoyed our show. Today I was, you know, with work and I was at a coffee shop uh, there in Picayune and a gentleman came up to me and he was like, hey man, I've really been enjoying um, God and Country. I've been enjoying watching, you know, the show. And then I was in Natchez today as well. And I was had to be in Natchez this morning, you know, for eight, uh, for, for 10 o'clock. And um, was there in Natchez and this gentleman walked up and he said, hey man, Really been enjoying you and Reed on God and Country. And so I was in Natchez uh, this morning, and then I was in uh, Picayune this afternoon, and two different gentlemen come up and talk about how they're enjoying the show. So that's really good. And that's some good feedback to just people. One guy I knew, but the other gentleman, I didn't know who he was. It was the first time I met him today. And so for, for him to just randomly come up and say, I'm enjoying the show, that's really good, and it encourages me. He just recognized you because he had seen the show somewhere. Yes, he recognized because he saw the show. I, you know, I should have asked. I should have asked, hey, man, where'd you watch it at? You know, but I, I didn't ask. I was, you know, I was there for, for work. And, and so we talked a few minutes, you know, about, about God and Country and about the show. And, and so he kind of asked, you know, what is our, he did ask me what our thoughts were and direction and stuff like that. We had a great few minute conversation, you know, about, about the show, but it was pretty cool. You know, to be somewhere and to have a random gentleman walk up and be like, hey, man, we've been watching God of Country. I thought that was pretty awesome. Well, it was after episode one. Uh, I had an uncle of mine who lives in Neely, Mississippi. If you know where that is, it's in Greene County, just north of Leakesville. After episode one, he called me and said, man, did I see you on, on Facebook with Dan Carr? I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you probably did. And uh, it was a couple of weeks after that, one of my grandmothers asked me, uh, are you doing a show with Dan Carr? And you know, what they have in common is that both of these relatives are, of mine are, are Baptists from here in the great state of Mississippi. So um, it, it's awesome to see how the show is taking off. I think that um, everything that the Midnight Ride Network is doing uh, is gaining a lot of steam. It's exciting, but this, you know, there is, there is something special about the show. You and Jim are doing a great job. You know, and we're we trying, really, man. Yeah, y'all are doing great. And I really appreciate all the people on Twitter and, you know, and social media that's been sharing and, you know, really appreciate that because that's how our show gets out. You know, it's by people just talking and by people just sharing, retweeting, or I guess you can call it re-Xing now. And uh, reposting, you know, re-Xing right. something. You know, just getting out the information. And I really love to hear, you know, you mentioned, you know, two relatives, you know, who are Baptists, you know, because that's what this show is really all about, right? It's about God and country. And it's about getting Christians to engage in this political arena. You know, I believe that our country's in a mess. And we're going to talk about some of the mess, you know, today on the show. But I mean, I believe that, that we are in a mess. But one thing, people say, how do you fix it? Well, one way you don't fix it is by just vacating the arena. Yes. By just leaving the political arena. You know, one way is by getting engaged and getting involved. And that's why it is so important. You know, that we have Christians, you know, all over, you know, who are engaging in the political system, you know, because we need Christians to engage on the local level. Most importantly, I was talking to a friend of mine, you know, he and I both have worked on some national races. We've both been involved in state races and we've won some and we have lost some. And one thing that we talked about today and we, we were talking a few minutes, you know, today about was was the importance of Christians being involved locally. You know, like right there in your own city, you know, just being involved. That's where that government touches you more than any other government, right? Absolutely. I mean, that local government, whether it's in your city, whether it's in your county, I mean, that that government is going to affect you every single day. Sometimes I question that, though. It was a couple of weeks ago. I was uh, writing that, you know, that paycheck from my, my taxes, right? Paying my taxes. I thought, I don't know, I'm paying a lot more in federal taxes than anywhere else. So, you know, the, the local system, the local level of government is supposed to be the one that hits us the most. But sometimes I feel like it's the feds, man. We, we've got a total imbalance of power, totally op opposite of what the founding fathers wanted, you know? You're right. I agree. I agree 100%. And so um, whenever you look at that, you know, government, you look at your local city, and then you look at the county, and then you look at the state, 
And then you look at the national, you know, it all affects you, right? It all, like you mentioned about your paycheck. And, you know, whenever you look at that, you know, how much money they're taking out. I mean, it is, I saw a post the other day. It was, it was really good that it was, I forget exactly how it went, but it went something like, you know, I'm, you know, my paycheck gets taxed and then I, I, I buy groceries and pay taxes on my groceries with already tax money. And then I go to dinner and I pay taxes on my meal with already tax money. Right. And then I'm paying land tax, my property tax with money that's already been taxed. I mean, there's just so much money that we pay in taxes. It's, it's incredible. And then you have inflation, right? The most insidious, maybe the most hidden of taxes. Inflation is becoming obviously one of those big, you know, uh, top three, you know, uh, go, you know, yeah. third rail type issues in American politics today, because you go to the grocery store, of course, you're going to get hit with inflation or the gas pump or whatever it is. But inflation really is a hidden tax on the American consumer. So you're using inflated currency, right? Right. You're giving half of it back to the government. Then what's left over, you're paying sales taxes on your groceries, you're paying your property taxes on land that is supposed to be yours, right? All these other taxes. Um, it was about 10 years ago, I found a statistic. I don't know if it's true, but I could believe it if it is true. It estimated that 75 cents of every dollar that you earn goes back to the government in some way. And I'm thinking 75 cents might be a conservative estimate. Well, I will tell you this. I believe there's around 70 to 75 different taxes that we pay. Whenever you look at all the taxes we pay, and you mentioned property, someone said to me they were they they own their own land. Like I'm a I'm a landowner. Well, yeah, I know what you're saying, but yeah. technically you're not. I mean, technically, yes, you might not owe a bank anything, or you might not owe any person, but you just quit paying property tax. Yeah, see what happens to your and, land. Yeah, your and, land. Yes, right? and see how long you own it. You know, th I were you know, my home, you know, and my property, just if I don't pay my property tax and my property taxes were $2,678, oh you know, for a year, that's what I pay for my property tax. And so if I don't pay that for three years, they're going to put this place up for auction just for the taxes. And so somebody technically could get this property for $7,500, $8,000 after three years. So you really never own and I hate that because, I mean, I, I mean, you just never really own your own property. Uncle Sam is everybody's landlord, right? That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you just just don't pay your taxes for a couple of years and see how long that property is yours or that house is yours, there'll be a U-Haul truck pulling up. Or there'll be a lock on your door. You'll get a letter in the mail saying that your home was sold. And so, but when you look at all that, you know, I, I've been really watching the news lately, been, been glued to the news about President Trump and how President Trump is in court. You know, whenever it comes to, you know, some, it's just the the liberal media or the liberals, the Democrat Party, just doing all that they can to keep Trump in a courtroom so he's not out campaigning. Right. But I do want to finish this thought back to what we were talking about a while ago, you know, back to people that are watching and people that are tuned in. It's important for Christians, and that's what this show is all about, you know, Christians to be engaged in their city and in their county and their state and also and also in the in the government there in D.C. It's important that we're engaged and we're involved. So whenever you have things happen like that's happening to Donald Trump, you know, people are engaged and they know what's going on. They know that this, all it is, is a witch hunt, right? I mean, that's all it is. They know that Joe Biden is... They call him Sleepy Joe for a reason. I mean, they know that he is not like he was back 30 years ago. Well, I mean, even 30 years ago, he wasn't particularly bright. He's never I been one of the particularly right. bright guys in the U.S. Senate. And uh, now is not exactly prime time for, for Joe Biden. Absolutely right. But whenever you look at they know that Joe Biden on a debate stage will get destroyed by Trump. They know the longer Trump is out and these swing states, they know that our chances of winning go up even higher. They know as long as Donald Trump is out making speeches, things are going to look really good for President Trump. And they know that the numbers are not good for Joe Biden because, as you mentioned a while ago, talking about inflation. Listen, I have five children. I've been married, wife, five children. And, and I remember back, I remember back four or five years ago, right? Groceries were $250. $225. A gallon of milk was like, I don't remember exactly how much it was, but I remember paying $250, $300 a week in groceries. Right now, I'm spending double that. You know, for a family, a wife, and five children, I'm spending $450 to $500 every single week in groceries. A gallon of milk, I bought a gallon of milk the other day, it was almost $5. I mean, if you go buy a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, peanut butter and jelly, you're going to spend 
it, it feels like you're going to spend fifty dollars. Imagine doing that on minimum wage. I know. It's I mean, like I mean, you, I do have to wonder how people on minimum wage are even making it. Like I mean, how many incomes are they having to combine just to get by in all this? You know? Did you know that the average the average salary for a teacher from 1993 to the present has changed very little? So like their 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 dollar is worth so much less than it was in 1993. Obviously, mm. it's worth dramatically less than it was four years ago. But the average pay for a teacher in the United States has changed by a few thousand dollars. That's utterly wild to me. And we have the cost of a house basically doubling from around, like the average cost of a house was a little over two hundred thousand back then. Now it's over four hundred thousand now. So we're seeing just a gradual slipping away of the American dream in large part because of inflation and the Federal Reserve but also just because of, of stupid policies passed by Congress. We have a, a Congress, a federal government uh, that, that does not, that cannot put limits on its spending. And it's, 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 it's getting all, all of the money that it gave to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan last week came at the, ex, at the expense of the American taxpayer. I mean, that was, it came at the expense of not just us, but our kids, our grandkids, their kids after them. Um, I think about this a lot. I mean, this is really one of those questions I think about every day. I really think that our middle class is disappearing at such a rate so that in 10, 15 years, America is going to be a country of renters. We're going to be something more like what, what, what the average person in the UK is. The UK, they don't have a middle class. They have a landlord class, they have a serf class, and they have like the homeless, right? Basically a three-tiered caste system. That's what the, the Federal Reserve is sending us into in this country and our stupid government. Yeah, whenever you look at the government, you see what's happening. You're talking about that inflation, about teacher pay, you know. But I'm gonna tell you what you. Whenever you look at, and uh, take Mississippi for an example. Let's talk about teacher pay for for a moment. When you take Mississippi, and I'm gonna give you. This is gonna be strictly. This is my opinion, right? I'm gonna give you my opinion on what I think about on on education. And I, I'm not. I'm not gonna sit here and claim to be a education major. I don't have. I'm not an education. Um, a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but I'm not a uh, I'm not a whiz in this area. But here's what I will say: Mississippi has 170 something different school districts. Harrison County, the county that I live in, has five. We've got Harrison County School District. We've got Gulfport, Long Beach, uh, Pass Christian, then I think Diarville and Bluxy. There's five different school districts right here in this county. We have three million people that lives in Mississippi. 170 something school districts. Florida has. More people than Mississippi, correct? Oh, absolutely. You know how many school districts they have? No idea. Less than 80. Really? Less than 80. So we just have too many school districts for too few people is, is what you're implying? So what I'm implying is this. You take all of those school superintendents, I'm going to make a lot of people happy <laughs> or mad at me. You take all those school superintendents, their average salaries are well over $100,000. The, 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 the person that is over... Mississippi education in Mississippi is making over $300,000. And so whenever you look wow. at how much money is going to administrative cost, and if you take that money and if you consolidate school districts and you consolidate from 177 to go down to, we have 82 counties. I don't even believe that every county needs a school district. But just say if you went from 177 down to 82, you're consolidating uh, and you're going to save a lot of money. Look at the administrative costs you're going to save with, with administrators. Look at the uh, the 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 money you're spending on office furniture, the money that you're spending on buildings, the money you're spending on water bills and light bills. I mean, you're going to save a lot of money if we were to consolidate. And then you could take that money and put it back into the classroom, hire more teachers, put more teachers in the classroom, or give the teachers a pay raise. And I know Mississippi, the legislators have been working really hard to give our teachers a pay raise because they deserve. I mean, they work hard. And some people say, I was talking to somebody the other day. And he said, you know, a teacher, I mean, they work 8 to 2.30 or 3 o'clock every day, and then they're off three or four months or two months out of the year. Not you know, really. Why do they, why do they really. need to get a pay raise? Well, here's what I told them. I said, first off, that's not true. First off. Secondly, these teachers get to school a whole lot earlier than 8 o'clock. And <laughs> thirdly, they stay later than whenever the kids get, get, um, get out of school. And they're having to grade papers. They're having to do a whole lot of other things. You know, they're working 50, 60 hours a week and then some of them are driving the school bus i know a teacher he teaches in the school he he drives the school bus so he gets there like six o'clock in the morning he drives a bus picks up the kids bring them to the school he teaches from eight to three three thirty then he drives the bus home so he doesn't even get home until five thirty six o'clock back to his house so he's working 12 hours a day and he's making like thirty thousand dollars a year oh my gosh and i mean it's it's unbelievable and so we were able to 
consolidate a lot of these school districts, we could put more money into our teachers' pocket. And I'm for that 100%. I am for giving our teachers what they need. They need they need more money, uh, better salaries, more teachers in the classroom. I mean, those are good things that we can do if we can just consolidate it. And we were just smarter whenever it comes to government. But I'm going to tell, tell you this, man. Whenever you look at the, the number of pay, you know, these school teachers... I don't believe they're. I don't believe they're making enough money. But some of these school superintendents are making way too much money. Way too much. They're way overpaid. You know, you're a school superintendent. You know, and you're not doing more work than these principals. Uh, you're not doing more more work than these school teachers. And you're making, in some cases, three times the money, and in some cases, even five times the money. I mean, that is that is ridiculous that that's happening right here. And so going back to. You know, that's why this is one reason why I believe that Christians are to be engaged and be involved. So you know what's happening, you know what's going on, not just in your schools, but also, you know, in your in your in your state government, in your county government, in your state government, in your federal government. I mean, it's important that we know what's going on. And so then you let's talk about these college campuses. You know, that's been on the that's been on the news like crazy this week, you know, with some of these some of these college campuses where these students are just going crazy over this Israel Hamas, you know, Israel fighting Hamas. And let's just get one thing straight before we get started into that. The only thing that Israel is doing or did was defended their people. You had Hamas. You had these terrorists, and I'm going to keep calling them terrorists because that's what they are. You had these terrorists come into Israel and kill and murder, rape, behead innocent women, innocent children, innocent men. And Israel did what Israel should do. You know, some people I read, I've re- I read a lot. Some people say, well, Israel didn't respond fast enough. You know, what took them so long? I don't, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah, so are you referring to Benjamin Netanyahu ordering the troops to stand down for like seven hours on October Correct. the 7th. Okay. Correct. Yeah, that, that perplexes me too. I don't, I don't really know I don't what's understand going on there. Why. I don't understand what was going on with, with that. You know, I don't understand. You know, I read where Israel had the intelligence that that was going to happen. You know, I don't understand all of that. You know, I read where we had the intelligence that 9-11 was going to happen, and we didn't stop that. I mean, you read so much, and I, listen, I don't know what's true, what's not true. Here's what I know is true. A mosque terrorist came into Israel and killed innocent men, innocent women, and innocent children, cut their heads off. I know that's a fact. I mean, we saw it. We watched the news. We watched it happen. I know that's a fact. And I'm going to tell you something else I know is a fact, is that Israel has every right to defend themselves. In my opinion, to wipe out the terrorists completely off the face of the map. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with wiping out the terrorists. That's a basic right afforded to every country. Israel's not an exception. Absolutely. Whenever 9-11 happened to America... It took us a little bit to respond. We had to regroup. We had to know what's going on, what's happening. And maybe that's what was happening with Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin I'm not sure on that, but I know that we had to regroup. We had to relook at it and see what's happening. Where's this coming from? And then, by God, we went after those terrorists. And it took some time to finally get to oh, uh, uh, to the gentleman that was responsible. We made for a lot it. of serious mistakes. Tora Bora, December two, you know, two thousand and one. We let Osama bin Laden escape from Afghanistan to Pakistan for reasons we still don't fully understand. Correct. The then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld had the opportunity to take out Osama bin Laden three months after nine eleven. They said no. Let's let him go into Pakistan for whatever reason. You know why? Because the U.S. government didn't want Osama bin Laden. They wanted an excuse to go to war. They wanted an excuse to send more troops into Afghanistan to enrich the defense industry, and they got it. 21 years of pointless war, trillions of dollars of our money wasted, of our wealth, of our treasure, of our soldiers wasted away in Afghanistan. So um, whenever we talk about Benjamin Netanyahu, I'll say this. um, Maybe you have a different opinion. I'm not sure what to make of Benjamin Netanyahu because have you ever read about how Benjamin Netanyahu has been on the record numerous times? And I mean, I could pull up quotes right now straight from the horse's mouth, talking about how he actually propped up Hamas. Now, he, Benjamin Netanyahu has actually propped up Hamas, uh, allowed foreign aid to go into Gaza to get into the hands of Hamas. He's actually allowed weapons to get into Gaza in order to support Hamas, to prop up Hamas, because if the more moderate Palestinian authority were to be governing Gaza, then that would undermine the case that Israel should occupy the entirety of the Holy Land. So 
because it's Hamas, this radical evil terrorist, I totally agree. Hamas are some of the most despicable people on earth, maybe the most evil people on earth, right? Um, but whenever we talk about um, Hamas governing this country, that makes it impossible for everyday people in Israel to petition their government to, to come to some sort of you know solution uh, with the Israeli government, right? So Benjamin Netanyahu, I'm not sure what to make of him. Let's also reflect back to 2002. You might remember this. You were an adult. I was a little bitty kid uh, whenever this happened. 2002, Benjamin Netanyahu actually testified before Congress, imploring Congress to invade Iraq, to overthrow Saddam Hussein. This is the year before we actually went into Iraq, right? He actually said that if we were to topple Saddam Hussein, then we could encourage, then we, we could encourage the Iranian people to overthrow their government as well. Well, what's happened? We invaded Iraq. We totally destabilized Iraq. ISIS went in. Iraq, what's left of it, has become nothing but a hotbed for Iranian terrorism. So either Benjamin Netanyahu is a complete idiot on foreign policy, at least with respect to what happened to Iran, uh, or um, he, is he was intentionally spreading very bad ideas geopolitically for some sort of ulterior purpose. Uh, so Benjamin Netanyahu, I, as, you can as you can gather by now, I don't have the, the, the strongest feelings towards Benjamin Netanyahu, but that's very different than how I feel about the state of Israel. Uh, distrusting a head of state uh, of another country is not the same thing as disliking that other country, well, we which both, I don't. We I have both a spiritual, don't trust Joe Biden. We both don't trust Joe Biden. And he's our Absolutely. president. Absolutely. I don't trust almost any politician. I don't trust Nancy Pelosi, I don't even Joe trust Biden, dog catchers. Mala Harris. No, exactly, right? So you and I so have I'm a spiritual connection, a spiritual connection with the people of Israel. They Correct. gave us the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But Benjamin Netanyahu... That's a different story, man. Maybe you disagree. Maybe there's a, an argument for Benjamin Net Netanyahu that I've not heard, but I don't know, man. The guy kind of just, yeah, looking at his record, looking at some of the stuff he said, like looking at the fact that he has boasted about propping up Hamas, giving them money, allowing foreign aid to go in. He actually sent um, one of, uh, so it was someone in his cabinet to the Middle Eastern country of Qatar a few months ago to actually talk about Qatar sending money to Hamas. So the Israeli government is allowing another government in the Middle East to send funds to Hamas. For what reason? So I, I don't want to think that Benjamin Netanyahu has the blood of all those Israeli people, including those several do dozen children on his hands, but I don't know. I think the truth is going to come out. What is done in the dark is going to come to the light. It always will, every single time. You know, but whenever I look at Hamas and the nation of Israel, and whenever I look at the United States of America, you know, I am always going to stand on the side of supporting Israel, you know, every single time. I'm always going to be, we need to support Israel. Now, the way that I believe that we should support Israel might be different than how somebody else believes that we should support Israel. Like, I do not believe and I do not want to send our men and women to Israel to go fight. I don't want to put boots on the ground. I don't want to send troops to Ukraine. I don't want to send troops to Iran. I don't want to send troops. I do not believe that the United States of America needs to be the police of the world. Like, I don't believe that's what we need to be. And unfortunately, so many people want the United States of America to be the police of the world. And they say, well, it's better to fight wars over there than over here. Now, I will agree with that. It is better to fight a war. If we are going to go to war, I would much rather fight, you know, Russia and Russia or whoever in their country. But at the end of the day, if you want to keep from having a war, you just let our military just continue to be the strongest military right. in, that the world has ever known. You know, you just keep keep our military strong. Don't take don't take our missiles and don't take our planes and don't take our ships and and not continue to build or continue to update or send them to another country. You keep the United States of America strong. You keep our economy strong. You do things. Our greatest threat, in my opinion, our greatest threat is not China. It is not Russia. It is not Iran. It is not terrorist. Our greatest threat is right here within. Our greatest threat right now seems to be our own White House. It's the you know, U.S. government. Amen, I mean, that brother. seems to be our greatest threat. And that's why I'm going to go back and say it, and I'm going to keep saying this, and the more you watch God and country, I hope you get a fire underneath you because I'm going to always hit this. This is why we need Christians engaged and involved. I read an article the other day where this preacher was, pre uh, he read an article about how Christians don't need to be involved in a political arena. I was like, how dumb is that? I mean, that's one of the most dumbest things that I've ever heard, you know, that Christians should not be engaged in the political arena. Whenever you look at the threats to America, you know, if you want, China's not going to mess with a strong America. There's no country in the world that will mess, that wants to mess with a strong America. It's not going to happen. But whenever you look at Israel, 
and Hamas coming in and Hamas killing these men and women. Regardless of who's right, who's wrong, who should have did what, who shouldn't have did what, I'm for supporting Israel. I am for sending them, you know, uh, if whatever Israel needs, I'm for sending it. Except I don't want to send our troops. They don't need our troops. They don't need that. They're a tough country. They're, they, they, they have can one handle of the finest themselves. militaries in the world. They Absolutely. can handle themselves. But here's what I do believe. I do not believe that we should ever give anyone any money without oversight. You know, like we just gave Ukraine ninety billion dollars. Now I'm a I'm a post of that. That was it ninety billion. Well, Ukraine got sixty point eight billion. Sixty point eight billion. Uh, so altogether, that the package was for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and it was about ninety four billion altogether. Okay. Sixty point eight of that was Ukraine. And how much oversight? Well, none. How much? It's going to go into Joe Biden's money laundering yeah. operation. I mean, this is unbelievable. Like I'm not for like. I don't think we should give Ukraine a dollar. Like, I'm not even for giving them a dollar. Amen. Not even one dollar. Um, who else do we give money to? Syria? No, Taiwan? So um, here, here's what's interesting. So Ukraine is now the top recipient of U.S. foreign aid. Uh, second is Israel, far behind. So Ukraine gets about $16 billion per year. Israel gets $3.6 billion. Very, like, Israel gets a fraction compared to what Ukraine gets every year. You'll never guess what country gets the third highest amount of foreign aid per year. It's Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Syria is also in the top 10. And so is the country of Yemen, the small war-torn country of Yemen on the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Look, Why? Th- this might we have roads people. and bridges collapsing right here. Th- yeah. Listen, if, if, if our government wants to give Syria money, start a GoFundMe page. <laughs> right? I mean, and I know Syria said, well, you're a Christian and you're saying that. Yeah, because it's, it's easy for me to give away your money. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, like we need to give Ethiopia $50. Okay, Reed, give me $50. Well, I mean, I have guns, so, you know, you want to think twice before trying to take my money away, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, so if, you want to give, if you want to give Ethiopia $50, then start a GoFundMe page There's for There's nothing Ethiopia. against private philanthropy, right? If somebody cares enough about Syria or Ukraine for whatever reason, or Ethiopia or whatever, Timbuktu, <laughs> let them give their own money. Yeah, I give a lot of money to charity. And I, me and my family, my wife and I, we give we give money to charity. There's a lot of things that we do in other countries to where we give money to help missionaries. We give money to help build orphanages. We give, and I'm not putting a feather in my hat. I'm just stating facts. You know, we help fund uh, water, you know, in other countries and clean water and stuff like that. So we do a lot of things to help in other countries. And we do a lot of things to help here. You know, paying, we help people pay light bills and we help people pay water bills and we help people buy groceries. And I mean, there's a lot of things that we do right here whenever it comes to charity. And I don't expect anyone, I don't, but I don't come and take your money to do it, and I don't force you to do it. I don't force you to give me $50 to give it to somebody else who's not willing to go get a job and go work. I don't do that at all. It's, we do it through our church. And so I do believe that the church is a great place for charity, for people to give them, for people to help the community. And I believe that's where it should start. But the government should never, should never take my tax dollars and send it to Syria and take my tax dollars and send it to Ethiopia. No, take my tax dollars and pave my roads, right? And that's about it. I don't want the government doing yeah. very much else. If, if you're going to take my tax dollars, fund the military, you know, with my, with right. my, with my right. taxes. You know, if, if you, look, I'm for school choice, and I think the government needs to get out of school education altogether. But if, if you're going to take my money, at least put it in my school that's in my neighborhood, right? Or let me let that money go to the school that I send my kids to. Like a charter system, school Correct. voucher. Or yes. school choice, you know, which I am for 100%. Yes, that's that makes sense. Um, my tax dollars shouldn't be going to a school that my kids don't go to. Let my tax dollars go to a school that my kids do go to. I mean, that just that's just, that's just logical to me. Right. That just makes sense to me. You know, but when you look at all this, you know, we shouldn't be giving Ukraine no money. You know, we shouldn't be sending Syria. They should be giving us money, I'm pretty sure. Correct. Yeah. We shouldn't be giving um, Syria or Ethiopia. You know, uh, like I said, if you're for all of that and if you want to give all of this money away, listen, go start a GoFundMe page and give all the money that you can. Give it to your local church, help missions and all that, but don't take tax dollars and send it overseas. Now, the nation of Israel, now this is where people say, well, Dan, you're a hypocrite. And maybe I am whenever it comes to the nation of Israel, okay? So maybe maybe I am a hypocrite, right? <laughs> Call me what you will. But I am for supporting the nation of Israel. You know, and our, I mean, they are our ally. You know, and whenever you look at some of these other countries, that they're our ally. They're our strong ally. We do trade with them. I mean, we go into agreements with them that if we go to war, you know, they're going to help us. If they go to war, we're going to help them. But there has to be 
a, an agreement where they're putting up the same that we are. We're not, we should not be supporting all these other countries and they're not putting in anything. You know, like America's given all this money and all this foreign aid to, to fund the stinking world and these other countries just are, are, are taking our money and, and, and they're taking advantage of America and our government's letting it happen. But when it goes back to Ukraine, you talk about Joe Biden. How much money of that you think is going to stay in Ukraine? It's going to go back to the Democratic Party. It's going to go to, to creepy billionaire oligarchs uh, lurking in the shadows of the Ukrainian government. It's going to go to persecuting uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. That's what that's where it's going to go. So when you look at and it's going to go actually, it's going to go to the military industrial complex here in America. Companies like 100%. Boeing and Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics. I know I'm going to be I'm missing a few, and I'm going to be kicking myself for it. But that's where it's going to go. Why are we giving money to a country that is persecuting Christians? You know, you give, we're giving money to Ukraine, and they're persecuting Christians. You know, I mean, and we're I mean, that that just doesn't make sense to me. You know. Uh, there's a lot that I could say there, but people would twist right. my words, you know, and, and they would make me out to be some kind of... They're doing that anyway, man. Yeah, but uh, we should not be giving them a, a penny. Right. We shouldn't be giving them a penny. You reject God. You you have socialistic countries. You, I mean, you're doing all of this stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Then you get in trouble and you want America to come and bail you out. And if America's not careful, we're going down the same path. We're going down the same road. You know, we're becoming a godless society. We're murdering our babies. You know, we believe that men can, you know, dress like women. We let our we let our men, you know, put on thong panties and a skirt and put on some kind of bra and go dance in front of our five and six year old little girls. And we want to act like that's normal. You know, it's a bunch of perverts is what that is. But we're acting like that's normal in today's society. You know, where do you think America's heading? I mean, the direction that we're going, it's unbelievable. And that's why you have all of this stuff that's happening on these campuses. Let's talk about Columbia University for a moment. Have you watched the news and seen what's happening on Columbia so University? I have seen that. There's an interesting fact I want to point out here. So uh, whenever it comes to the foreign aid that we give Israel, it's about $3.6 billion per year. You know how much of an endowment we give Columbia University every year, a supposedly private university? $13.6 billion. The uni Columbia University in New York City gets $10 billion more dollars per year. And the state of Israel gets in U.S. taxpayer dollars. So okay, okay. In the grand say, say that again. Things, say that again. No, no, so, it, it's so, fine. So, say that again no, so, it, so that so the viewers can understand exactly what you just said. They get how much more money? $10 billion per year. Of our taxpayer money. Our tax dollars. So Columbia, wow. Columbia, not the country Columbia, Columbia University, right. an endowment of $13.6 billion per year. Wow. Israel gets about $3.6 billion per year. Wow. Yeah. Puts things into perspective, right? So when it comes to... And I've told you before, I don't believe we should be giving foreign aid to any foreign country, at least not in the form of U.S. taxpayer dollars, right? But when it comes to the amount of money that we give Israel every year in the form of foreign aid in comparison to our, our overall budget, it's a drop in the bucket. I mean, it really is. I mean, if you want to get, if you want to be a fiscal hawk and cut back on spending, uh, federal spending, like foreign aid to Israel is just not the place to start, mathematically speaking. Uh, so whenever it comes to cutting back foreign aid, cutting back government spending, reducing the debt, reducing the deficit, Israel's not even close to the place where I personally start uh, with anything like that. But getting back to your question, yes, I've been following the craziness at, uh, at, at Columbia University, one of our so-called elite schools, right? Yeah. So I saw where um, <laughs> they've had, I think, over 133 arrests now, wow. you know, uh, arrests. I think they're, from what I've read, they're no longer doing in on-campus school. I think now you can do it online. Didn't you say that was going on for the rest of the year? Yeah, like the rest of the semester. I mean, it's unbelievable. And the reason is because they have a bunch of pro-Hamas, pro these pro-people that are on there chanting, cuss cursing, threatening these Jewish students. I mean, just wreaking havoc all over the campuses. And let me just say this. I am for freedom of speech. I believe, I, here's what I believe. If, listen, we live in the United States of America and I might disagree with you on, let's just bring up a subject. We might disagree on the war in Israel, right? On how it should be done. And you might want to do a protest and you might want to go out there and, and get a protest and put it on Facebook and, and get 25 or 30 people together and protest giving money to Israel and protest us supporting the nation of Israel. And if you want to do that, I believe that you have 
a constitutional right to do that. Right. That's a const. Everybody gets that. Everybody. Yep. Even if we disagree, like I believe that men are to marry women. Women are. To, that's what I believe. Right. That's what. That's what I believe. And if I wanted to do a, if I wanted to get some people out here, and if I wanted to do a march for pro marriage between a man and a woman, I have that constitutional right to do that. Reed, I'm sure you believe the same as I me. I believe the same thing. Don't don't worry about that. Yeah. But but just yeah. say Yeah, we don't disagree. <laughs> just say if if some if some other guy believes that it's okay for a guy to marry a guy. Let's pick on Jim Sigelski. If Jim Sigelski, <laughs> uh, the co-founder of the Midnight Ride, I'm wants, not gonna to, wants pick to stage on Jim. a protest <laughs> for to, you know, he wants to protest for, you know, let's say two Jack Fairchild. <laughs> yeah, Jack Fairchild's, yeah. <laughs> we'll say Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's gonna Jack's gonna kill us both. I love you, Jack. And I love uh, you, Jack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> appreciate you, man. And uh, you're my friend. But if Jack Fairchild, <laughs> we'll use Joe Biden. How about that? Okay, there we go. If Joe Biden wanted to get on Facebook and get 20 guys out there to go do a march, he couldn't get 20 guys together because he doesn't have that many people showing up to his rallies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> But if he somehow managed to get 20 people together and go out there and march in support of gay marriage, he has that right. He has a constitutional right to do that, you know, and that's, been, that's in our constitution. You have that right. These students on these campuses of our universities, if they want to boycott wherever they want to boycott, they have that right to do it, but do it peacefully. They should not be threatening other students. Right. Okay, now you're getting outside of the constitutional right. You do have a constitutional right to voice your opinion. You do have a constitutional right to form a protest, but you do not have a constitutional right to threaten people. Right. You do not have a constitutional right to go burn buildings down. You do not have a constitutional right to throw bricks through windows. You do not have a constitutional right to go and set up tents all over the campus and cause people not to be able to go to school that they have been working hard. They worked all throughout high school to earn that GPA to get that scholarship. Or they're working at, some of them working at McDonald's, some of them drive an Uber so they can go to school, so they can get an education, so when they get out of college, they can go get a job. And now you've got some jerk that is on the campus, you know, causing a, a, a unbelievable protest racket. Um, they're wreaking havoc upon the campus and you're causing students not to be able to go to class. That is not a constitutional right. Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back, the my pillow guy. And you're looking good. I'm still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever, my pillow 2.0. <gasps> wow, it's so soft and smooth. It's cool to the touch. How did you do that? Well, we took my pillow's patented fill and combined it with this new technology that we didn't have back then when I invented my pillow to bring you the best pillow in history, my pillow 2.0. Just like all of you, I never imagined that my pillow could get any better. That's why I haven't changed it in nearly 20 years. Then I heard about a revolutionary new technology and I knew I had to bring it to you all. My pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of my pillow. The my pillow 2.0 is cooler and softer than the last my pillow. It is so comfortable to sleep on at night. I look forward to going to bed and I wake up well rested in the morning. Sleep is all about temperature and height. My Pillow 2.0's patented adjustable fill is going to give you the exact individual support you need from your head to your bed. And now here's where it gets even better. We've all experienced those temperature related sleep interruptions where you get too hot, you toss and turn, you flip your pillow over to the cool side. Well, all that's gone with my brand new MyPillow 2.0 cooling fabric that's made with temperature regulating thread. The best sleep just got even better. Whether you have a MyPillow or not, you need to get the brand new MyPillow 2.0. Call or go to MyPillow.com now. Use your promo code and for a limited time when you buy one, you'll get a second one absolutely free. You're sleeping even better. And cooler too. And you're looking good. Feeling good. I knew you would. Visit MyPillow.com. Those people are to go to jail. And I'm thankful that 133 so far have, and hopefully a lot more will, you know, go to jail. That'll stop a lot of this nonsense. Well, whenever one individual attempts to deprive another individual of their constitutional rights in this scenario, you know, those enshrined in the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, right? Or a group tries to do that to another group, or an individual to a group or whatever, 
that's whenever you get the civil authorities involved. That is one thing that the government exists to do, is to protect our liberties from being infringed upon by other people, right? That is its one most, that is its most fundamental function. But whenever I look at what's happening at, at, at Columbia University, like I said, one of our so-called elite universities, yeah. right? We see there, there was a, a Jewish professor in the business school uh, up there who, uh, who has, he had his, his college ID, his campus ID deactivated. Wow. And he was told that he could not come on campus because the administration could not guarantee his safety from all of these rioters. I'm not going to call them protesters. These rioters, yes, these troublemakers, rioters, these, yep. these jerks. Yep. Um, you know, I am, it, it's insane to me that, that the leaders of one of America's most highly ranked universities cannot protect a professor from a mob, or they refuse to protect him from a mob, regardless of where a person stands on Israel versus uh, Palestine or Israel versus Gaza. You know, no matter what the merits of your argument might be, whenever you are harassing other students, in this case, throwing hard objects like bricks and stuff at Jewish students or through windows, whenever you're snatching Israeli flags out of the hands of Jewish students and lighting those flags on fire, whenever you are telling them they can't come on campus or you're harassing them, you're not within the confines of the First Amendment anymore. You're not under the protection, rather, of the First Amendment. You're just being a jerk. You're being a troublemaker, and you deserve to go to jail. Absolutely. I agree. I'll try to explain it even a little bit further for, for some of us. I go to church every Sunday. I go to a Baptist church, right? right? Right across town, there's a Methodist church. And the Methodist church and the Baptist church were different in things that we believe. Not, not major, but there are some differences between the Baptist and Methodist church. Could you imagine Sunday morning if we show up at the Methodist church at 10 o'clock and they start church at 10 o'clock and we walk in and we say, hey, uh, we're going we're gonna to have church here today. You know, y'all are going to have to just sit down and be quiet. You know, we're going we're gonna to have church here today. Let me ask you a question. Do I have the right to have church on Sunday? Absolutely. Do I have the right to have church at 10 o'clock on Sunday? Whenever you want. Okay. Do I have the right to get as many people together as I possibly can and have church on Sunday? As long as it's on your property or the church, your church's property. Hold on now. Come on, Reed. So you're telling me that I cannot get my church to go down to the Methodist church on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock when they're having church and tell their preacher to sit down and the rest of his congregation to sit down and be quiet and we're going to have church in their church when they're supposed to be having church? Well, you can't do that in this country, but there are other countries where you know you might be able to get away with something like that. That, that don't make any sense to me. So you're telling me that I have to abide by some kind of some kind of, but I have a constitutional right, man. I mean, my, my constitution says that I have the right, you know, to go to church. I have the right of freedom of speech. I can't go there and just take over their church. No, no. That is what's happening. You know, that's what's happening. You know, as I watched several years ago, a couple of years ago, whenever these kids and people were rioting in the streets and burning buildings and throwing rocks at, and I mean, when they were calling out a protest, and then they, even some of these. Uh, people in Congress called it a peaceful protest. What? Like, I mean, are you crazy? Oh, but January the 6th was an insurrection. Yeah. Oh, a yeah. threat to our democracy. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. my gosh. And, and so you see all of this happening. Like, do you have the right to protest? Yes, but you don't have the right to riot. Right, right. To you destroy have... another person's property, yeah. to strip them of their liberties, to, to threaten violence against them or to commit violence against them. Correct. That's where it stops. You have the right to share your opinion. You have that fundamental right. You live in the United States of America. In North Korea, you can't give your opinion. Listen, I've said some things about Joe Biden today that if I had said that if I was a North Korea, you know, citizen and I lived in North Korea, me and you were trying to do this in no. North Korea, they, they'd have already put us in jail. Oh, yeah. They'd have already We'd be they, busting they, rocks right now. Absolutely. But we live in the United States of America. And let me just say this. And, and there's not a day that goes by. I disagree with my president, with Joe Biden. I disagree with him on near about everything. You know, honestly, I disagree with him on, on, on... I don't think there are three issues on which I agree with, with Joe Biden. There's probably not. Probably not, yeah. But I pray for the man every single day. Every morning, man, I pray for him and I pray for his wife. I pray for Jill. I pray for his son, even though I totally disagree with his son. You know, on, I mean, the guy needs to be in prison. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean good night. I pray for, I mean, all, a lot of them, you know, that I disagree with. Uh, but I'm not going to go... I'm not going to go to 
Joe, if Joe Biden was speaking across the street, I would not go over there and holler and scream and cuss him out. I would not do that because I respect the office of the president of the United States of America. I would not do that. And so all I'm saying is we have the right to express our opinions, but I don't have the right to get in your face and holler and scream and cuss you out and beat you over the head with a, with a uh, bottle and take your flag and go burn it in the street. I don't have the right to do that. Well, if you're Black Lives Matter or Antifa and you live in a blue city, it, it seems that maybe you do have that right. Well, you can actually take over the whole block. If you have a George Soros appointed DA in a city somewhere, then maybe you do have that right. You could take over the whole block, yeah. you know, like they did in Seattle. <laughs> like the, the Chaz, that's what they call it, like the whatever autonomous zone, right? Yeah, it's 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 unbelievable, man. I heard a, I heard a joke the other day. I got to tell you this joke. And uh, I'm not a good joke teller, teller but I'll tell it because this will lead us into the next thing that I want to talk about before we close out, you know, our um, show today. And uh, But there was this, uh, there was this girl and her mom and dad went to their neighbor's house for lunch. And they were going to have lunch, and the mom and dad was so proud of their daughter. They said, you know, our, our daughter, she's a little girl. She's amb She's got ambition. And, I mean, she wants to be the president of the United States of America. And the, and the neighbor, the gentleman, he looked at her, and he said, what would you like to do if you was president of the United States of America? And her mom and dad, you know, were Democrats. And, and um, she said, well, I would, feed the, I would feed the poor. You know, the, uh, the people that are homeless. She goes, I would, f I would make sure that they have food. I, I, would give them, I, I would give them food, and I would give them a place to stay. And the man said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal. I'll make a deal with you. How about you come over to my house this afternoon, and you cut my grass, and you weed in my yard, and you pull the weeds out of the flower bed, and then you wash my car. And when you get done, I'm going to give you $50. And with that $50 for you working, I'm going to give you $50, and then me and you are going to go down to Winn-Dixie. And we're going to buy some bread. We're going to buy some ham and bologna. And some, we're going to buy some Coca-Cola. We're going to buy some uh, peanut butter and jelly. And we're going to go out there and we're going to go find these, these people that they, they want something to eat. They're hungry. They're living out on the street. We're going to go give them this food. And she looked at him and she said, she goes, why would I want to give them my money? Why don't we go and get them and let them come to your house and let them wash your car and let them cut your grass? And let them pull the weeds out of your flower bed. And then you can give them $50 and then they can go buy their own food. And the gentleman looked at her and said, welcome to the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many times I hear, you know, people say, well, and I'm, and I'm seeing this happen on Twitter and on social media, you know, where, you know, if you're not willing to give people um, health care, and if you're not willing to give people, you know, more, you know, money, and if you're not willing to do this and do that, then you're not a very good Christian. I want to read a verse to you from the Bible. You know, at 2 Thessalonians 3, verse number 10. He says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So the Bible is saying that if a man is not willing to work, then he should not even eat. Is there anything more essential to life than eating? I mean, right? Eating? And drinking water? Right. I mean, there's really nothing more essential than that. And so what that's telling me, the Bible says that if a man is not even willing to work, that he shouldn't eat. The Bible says that if a man is not willing to take care of his family, that he is worse than an infidel. And so if the Bible's talking about working and eating, then how much more whenever it comes to this thing of insurance and Medicaid expansion, that we should not be giving people I don't believe we should be giving people anything. I believe people are to work. If you're going to have insurance, I believe that you should work. If you're going to eat, I believe that you should work. If you're going to have a place to live, I believe that you should work. If you're going to have lights cut on in your house, I get paid a paycheck. And with that paycheck, my light bill is due. I have to pay my light bill every single month. And if I don't pay that light bill, then my lights don't come on. My AC doesn't come on. And so, but I have to go work. I got up this morning pretty early and I've been working until like you saw when I walked in. You know, y'all was here at my house already. And I walked in, been working all day. You, you get up every morning and you work all day. Nobody's giving me free anything. We've got to work for it. And so whenever you're looking at society, it is not non-Christian to tell people that if you're going to eat, you need to work. It is not non-Christian to tell people if you're going to get health care, 
you need to work. It is not non-Christian to tell you that if you're going to have a place to live, you're going to have to work. You can't spend all your money. You cannot waste your money. You cannot just lay around your house and not go work and then expect the government or anybody else to take care of you. You have to work. You have to work. It is part of how God made us. Whenever God made Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden. To work the garden. He put them there to work the garden. That's right. That's what everybody forgets. They had a job to do. Listen, the world at that point in time was perfect. Animals got along with each other. You know, it was perfect, but yet they had to, the Bible uses the word dress. They had to dress it. They had to keep it. They had to work in the garden. And so from the very, the very beginning of man, man always had a job to do. Man always had something to do. From the very beginning of woman, she always had a job to do from the very beginning. And so I just want to encourage you here. Some of you are watching and some of you might be like, well, I don't agree with that. That's fine. We live in the United States of America and you can disagree with me totally. If you think that we're to give people health care, then by all means, that's up to you. If you believe that we should be feeding people every week and give them a place to live, if you believe that we should take care of people, that's up to you. But you're taking away their their sense of urgency and you're taking away that person's sense of pride. Whenever you take away that right. And whenever you just tell people that we're just going to give you money, we're just going to um, just take care of you, you're enslaving them is what you're doing. You're not helping them. You're not, you're not helping them get ahead in life. You're keeping them right where they're at on that same level. That's why instead of a handout, people need to get a job, you know, and get a job and go to work and work hard. I talk to people all the time and, and they, I talk to very few people that disagree with the fact that people shouldn't work. I mean, most people that I talk to believe that a man should go to work. And so I just want to encourage you, even if you disagree. Even most socialists agree with the basic premise that you should work for food, right? Absolutely. You, you, don't, you don't eat unless you work. That's right. And so even if you disagree, it still encourage people to work and get a job. And even you, if you're watching this and you're like, well, Dan, if, if, if um, you know, if I'm not going to be able to get insurance, or I'm not going to be able to do this, or I'm not going to be able to do that. I would encourage you yourself to work. I can remember whenever I was first married and even starting to have children, I was working two jobs. You know, I was working, you know, two jobs. And I remember one time I was working at the church. The church couldn't pay me a, a large salary. And then I was cutting grass. And so I would leave from, I would leave from working at the church. I would go cut grass until dark. And then at nighttime, from about 12 o'clock, I would go and pick up newspapers and I would deliver newspapers sometimes all night long. And so on Saturday, I would work at the church until about 3, 3.30. I would go and cut grass until dark time. I would go home, sleep for an hour, go get my newspapers, deliver newspapers until 6 or 7 o'clock Sunday morning, go get on a bus, go pick up boys and girls and bring them to church, be in church all day on Sunday, get done on Sunday night, go pick up newspapers on Sunday night, deliver newspapers all night Sunday night, on Monday morning, be back at work, Monday afternoon, cutting grass, and then crash Monday night. I mean, it was it was a rough schedule. You know, we were working, you know, 120 hours a week just trying to make ends meet. Oh, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying where there's a will, there's a way. So yeah. I've, I've told you before that I believe that the beginning of the end of America was the New Deal. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. And, and I'm, I'm saying that for a reason. I believe that our republic was always intended to be a place where whenever it came to most of our social needs, it would be families, friends, and churches that would step up yeah. to do things like help the poor, help the sick, right? But over the last hundred years, we've given way to this idea that it's, it's some monolithic government that's supposed to step in and make us a better person. Um, at different parts of this conversation, Dan, I've had to do a double take and make sure that I'm not talking to Ron Paul because at, at various moments you've sounded a lot like him, which is a good thing, by the way. Uh, one of one of my main role models, one of my my biggest living role models. Um, but fa I only th I think that the government we have today, I mean, it, it's going to go bankrupt. The, the federal government we have today, this big monolithic leviathan we have in Washington D.C., it's going to collapse whether it's because it's, it's too far into debt and, and we default on our debt, whether it's a geopolitical catastrophe, this government's going to collapse. And once that happens, it will be the role of families, friends, and churches to step up and play the role that, it was, that they were always intended to uh, from the moment that this country was built. So, Reed, let me say this. It's already bankrupt. Yes. I mean, $35 trillion in debt. It's already bankrupt. Yep. We're just printing money. That's it's all not even money. It was paper. Yeah, paper. It's just, just printing paper. That's all they're doing. It's just printing paper. And so when you look at, you know, $35 trillion in debt and they keep raising the debt ceiling, 
They keep vote, and you look at Congress and they're sending $95 billion to, or $60 billion to Ukraine and they're waving Ukraine flags on the House floor. I've never seen the Democrat treason. Party. Treason, that was treason. I have never seen the Democrat Party wave, wave American an American flags. flag. Yeah, but they'll all wave Ukrainian flags. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Listen, you know, the greatest thing people need is Jesus. And I know people, and I know people have a hard time with some of my stances because I'm like, I'm like, you know, if a man's not willing to work, a man shouldn't eat. The government shouldn't be buying you cheeseburgers. The government shouldn't be putting food on your table. That's not the government's role. That's not the government's responsibility. If I see somebody out there asking for food or asking for stuff, I'm going to get them. We're, we'll try to get them food. Right. You know, no matter what, no matter if they look like they're able to work or not, I will help them out of my own personal money. I don't think the government ought to be doing that. But if I personally want to do that, that's on me. Right. And so people think you have a cold heart because I say a man ought to get a job. A man ought to go to work every day. And then, then you need to balance your own budget. You need to save money. You don't need to go waste your money. I was looking, I was helping somebody with their budget not too long ago, about three months ago. And uh, I was looking at their budget and they were in the hole every month. They were smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, right? That's about $18, almost $20 a day in cigarettes. That's $140 a week in cigarettes. That's $560 a month in cigarettes. That's over $7,200 a year in cigarettes that they're spending <coughs> money on. And so I looked at them, I wrote it on paper. I said, you're spending $20 a day on cigarettes. That's $140 a week. That is, that whenever you do the math, you do four times 140. I mean, that's $560 a month. You're in the whole $450 a month. Quit smoking. Yeah, it's that easy. And you can cover all your bills. You don't have to get EBT. You don't have to get on a government assistance. All you got to do is quit smoking. And whenever you quit smoking, guess what happens? Number one, you can afford to pay for your bills. You can go get, matter of fact, you have money left over. You can go out, take your wife on a date once a week. You know, you have money left over. Uh, number two, you're going to feel good about yourself because you're paying your own way. Nobody's having to help take care of you. You're paying your own way. And I said, the third thing, you're going to feel good physically because you ain't smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. Three packs, I mean, three really? Packs, but dude, I've talked to you that smoke six packs a day. They had to have a job, a, a side job, just to pay for their smoking habit. I mean, it's incredible. Oh you, know, you do the math, six bucks, six packs a day, you're looking at $40. I couldn't afford $40 a day in cigarettes. Nope. I wouldn't want to, even if I could. I wouldn't want to pay 40 bucks a day, $280 a week in cigarettes. That's insane. That's more than a house note. Anyway, my point is, you say, well, if, if I don't... Uh, get this government assistance, then I'm not going to be able to do this. Well, you might have to back off of smoking if you smoke. You might have to, you might have to cut your cable bill off, you know, hundred bucks a month. You might have to not go to the movies every single week. You might have to cut back on a Coca-Cola every single day. I remember whenever I was working at the church, I would get a root beer and a, a honey bun every single day. I would drive down to the gas station. I would get a honey bun and a root beer. They were eating healthy, huh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could tell I ate very healthy. And so the root beer was a box root beer in a bottle. It was a dollar. My honey bun was 25 cents. I was spending a dollar 35 a week or a day on, on a honey bun and a root beer. But I wasn't expecting the government to pay for it. But if I needed to cut back on something, I would cut back on that. Now, 20 ounces, or we're giving a class on money, but now a 20 ounce bottle is over $2. If you drink one a day, that's 14 bucks a week. If you drink one every single day, that's $60 a month. It adds up. The government should not be taking care of you. We should be taking care of ourselves. You know, we should. Now, I said all that to say there are times that people struggle. Yes, that's different. There are different. times that people, that things happen. And I am for helping people. I think the church ought to be involved. I think the community ought to be involved. You know, I think that we ought to be helping people with their light bill because things do happen. You know, people do get sick. I mean, there, there are things that where people legitimately need help, and I am for that 100%. We help people every single week. Every single week, we help people with light bills. We help people with um, food, especially children. I'm not going to let a child go hungry because of a mom or dad's mistake. I'm not going to let a child not have lights on because of what a mom and dad's doing. I'm not going to do that to a child. We're going to help take care of that child. We're going to do all that we can, you know, to make sure that that child is taken care of. You know, we have 
things in our church where we do help people. And so, but what I'm saying is for the most people, we just need to get a job, maybe a better job, maybe get a second job, maybe balance our budget a little better, take care of our money a little better to where we're not just blowing and spending our money, maybe cut back on some things. And our country needs us to do the same thing. I mean, our country is spending money and giving money away like a bunch of drunken sailors. And so if we're going to, if we're going to get this whole thing under wrap, we got to cut back in some areas. I, I read this the other day. They said they think it's funny that the government that is $35 trillion in debt gives them a credit rating. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, but uh, anyway, I know I've, ran, I've talked a lot, but Luke, no, that was whole, fantastic. So hey, you're on fire here. Well, it's, um, it's, it's a, uh, it's an interesting topic. And I know that some people will say, well, you got a cold heart, you know, if you're not just willing to just give money away, you know, and I, I'm never going to be for just giving your money away. You know, I don't believe that I should do that as, a, as an American. I don't believe I should do that as a Christian. You know, just give your money away. Even, even when it comes to church, you know, we should take care of the money that God gives us. And personally, we should take care of the money that God gives us as a nation. We should take care of the money, you know, that God gives us. And so at the end of the day, I think it's important, you know, that we, that we do that. Reed, I've enjoyed this show. I've enjoyed being on. I've enjoyed um, talking about, I know we covered a, a, a variety of things. And I'm um, looking forward to next week. I will say this, that in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start having guests on. And uh, maybe a guest once every once, uh, maybe once a month or something. I'm looking forward to that. And I don't want to mention who our first guest is going to be, but we do have a guest lined up soon. And uh, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be good. Yep. And I cannot wait to see Jack Fairchild's uh, face in a couple of oh. days, whenever he listens to this episode. That's going to be glorious. Uh, I could only imagine. I, I'm probably, I'm going to get a phone call or a text message <laughs> or something from Jack. And, uh, but I do know that he's going to be on tomorrow. And so, I'm, there's, well, at least he'll have to wait till next week because he won't know about, we're not going to tell him about this until he watches it. He'll have to watch it on Thursday. So have you read The Lord of the Rings or touched on it at all? Because yeah. he's going to antagonize you about that. I haven't I haven't had a chance yet. And so I've got about seven of the books that I'm reading right now. Oh, wow. And so I haven't had a chance. But I will get to Lord of the Rings. It's I'm going to hold you to it. It's on, my, uh, cal it's on my schedule. I'll get to it eventually. So thanks for joining us. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Hey, guys, I know some of you are watching on Twitter. You're watching on Facebook. You're watching on Substack or wherever you're watching this show. I want to encourage you to share. That's how we get out our message. I know a lot of you have been sharing on X, and we appreciate it very much. I know many of you shared on Facebook and other social media platforms. Copy and paste the link on Rumble. Copy and paste the link on YouTube. And share it with your family. Share it with your friends. That helps us whenever it comes to the algorithm. A lot of these social media platforms, they don't want our message out. And so it takes you. You're going to have to help us. Once again, God bless you. And God bless the great United States of America. Hey guys, it's Reed here. I don't say this about a lot of people, but I have to say Mike Lindell is a real patriot and we could not be more thankful to him and my pillow for sponsoring today's episode of God and Country. Remember, go to mypillow.com and save huge on a great night of sleep by entering the promo code Midnight Ride. Thanks.